Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Percy, and I'm a member of the School of Political Science and International Studies here at UQ, and I'm also the Deputy Director of our new Graduate Center in Governance and International Affairs. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here today, and to specifically welcome you from the School of Political Science and International Studies. We're absolutely delighted that you've all been able to join us in Brisbane, and hopefully as well as finding out all the things you want to find out about the cutting edge of international relations, getting to know us and our school a little bit better. It is my very great pleasure today to have you here, and before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Turbal people, and the elders past, present, and emerging. It's my very, very great pleasure to introduce Peter Katzenstein. I'm not going to spend very long on my introduction because you all have an excellent and quite intimidating biography of Peter Katzenstein in your pr conference program. I think it's safe to say that Peter Katzenstein has reached a level of scholarship to which the rest of us can only aspire, and I think many of us will probably never achieve. He is the author of some 40, or editor of some 40 books, and many of them have been path-breaking in the subject of international relations. So we're very delighted to have him here today. But rather than talk about his academic accomplishments, I also wanted to talk about one of the reasons why I think it's so exciting that he's here at OSIS, which is a conference where we're also trying to mentor younger scholars and develop the field. And that's one of Peter's great strengths, is that he is a genuine scholar, by which I mean he has an extraordinary capacity to pass on knowledge and skills and teaching to younger scholars. And I first met Peter when I was at the University of Oxford, and he very kindly agreed to come and chat to a small group of, of PhD students. And they were very excited, and they were all a bit scared. And we had envisaged that it would be very informal, but instead Peter very kindly encouraged all of the students to talk extensively about their research, asked incredibly probing and incisive questions, and in some cases gave them really significant advice. And I don't know whether or not Peter remembers this occasion, but I can tell you that every single student in that room did. And many of them went on later to say that he was actually pivotal in changing some of the aspects of the way they thought about their work, and also really encouraging them to think that they had an important voice and important things to say in the discipline. And we only need to look at Peter's huge stable of incredibly successful PhD students to see that that's something he develops in his career. And that is also a standard to which I think we all should aspire, to remember that scholarship isn't always about what we publish, it's about how we mentor and um, how we develop younger scholars and the scholars of the future. And so hopefully many of you will have a chance to chat to Peter informally over the coming days of the conference and experience some of his warmth and scholarship in that more personal environment. But it is my very great pleasure to turn the floor over to Peter today to talk to you about some of his scholarly work. His subject today is American primacy in a world of regions. And I hope you'll join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an incredibly meaningful introduction. Thank you. So all lecture halls all over the world are the same. You need binoculars to see the audience. So welcome. And all attendees at lectures are the same. They sit close to the exit, OK? <laughs> um, I feel very much at home here. Uh, the rain has stopped, but the sky is gray. I was born in Hamburg, <laughs> and I spent my life living in Ithaca. Uh, I actually got as part of my package, I think Bronwyn put an umbrella in it. Bronwyn, I go to bed with an umbrella, okay? <laughs> so. uh, at the same time, while I feel very much at home, I also feel quite distant. I was sitting in a wonderful panel this morning on globalization and civilization, and while I listened to the very probing discussion, I said, why couldn't this happen in the United States? That is, why is the intellectual templates for some topics so different, even though everybody speaks English? And I don't have a good answer to that, but it, I think it has something to do with power, which in one way or another will come up in the next hour. Uh, but while I don't have an answer, I have an episode. Last night at, uh, um, at the, reception bef the reception before the dinner, Ryan, Walter, and I chatted, uh, and of course, inevitably, the topic turned to Donald Trump. Uh, 
and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and I delight my students uh, every year when I teach intro to IR to imitate Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> it's not much of an effort, okay? <laughs> but I told Ryan that I was probably the only person who had quoted Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of his books, in a book which I wrote myself. And I told him I actually knew where it was, but I was too stupid with the modern technology to dig up the quote with the proper citation. And I would give him part of my honorarium if he could produce it for this lecture. Well, being a junior scholar, which means being relatively poor, <laughs> Ryan spent the night doing it. <laughs> and here is the quote from Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I actually respect the book quite a bit, and as I respected him as a governor. The better you get, the less you run around showing off as a muscle guy. Pumping Iron, 1974, page 54. Quoted in Katzenstein, Corporatism and Change, Austria, Switzerland, and the Politics of Industry, page 211. <laughs> so just, that was the last sentence of a case study on the Austrian steel industry. So, <laughs> having dispensed with the introductory remarks, let's talk about this lecture. The lecture turns out to be part of my reconceiving my teaching. I spent a year, two or three years ago at the Harvard Business School to learn how they teach Harvard cases. And I've developed a couple of courses with this, and one of these courses has a theme like this one, and two of these lectures I sort of adjusted for this occasion. Um, I got two instruments to deal with here, okay. That's the outline. Number three and number six are the substantive parts. They deal with how we think about America and they deal with regions. Number one, two, and number uh, four, five are the bridges to get to the substantive parts. But before we start, I want to simply say something which is in the room for all of us, uh, which is how do we think about the election in the United States? Uh, other than saying it's a great upheaval. Uh, it's not the first time. There's a theory called the theory of critical realignments, and when I started, uh, when I was in graduate school, that was the period in the late 60s, and in particular the election of 1972, which was a pivotal period of realigning. Uh, and the theorist of realignment, I've forgotten his name now, uh, wrote memos in 1972, was a professor at MIT, uh, in testing his theory week after week after week. Uh, and it turned out 72 was not a realignment election, but 68 to 80 were. It was a realignment period, different from 1932, different from 1896. And I think we are in the United States at this time in a period of realignment which started in 2008 in a moment of great crisis, and without the financial crisis, Obama would not have become president. That is a firm conviction. You look at the public opinion polls, it was McCain's evident inability to understand what was happening that propelled Obama, gave him a lead of four or five percent in the public opinion polls, which he done, didn't relinquish. And Obama mobilized a part of an electorate which had not been mobilized before. And the same thing is happening today. Uh, with Trump mobilizing part of an electorate which has basically tuned out. And I live in upstate New York, which used to have industry and dairy industries, and now only has prisons. That's the main industry. And it is an economic disaster area. It has been an economic disaster area for decades, with neither Democrats nor Republicans giving a hoot about it. Once in a while they talk about it, but they don't do anything, right? And Upstate New York is not going to carry New York for Donald Trump. Uh, but upstate New York is next to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan. The entire Midwest will be in play for the Republicans in a way in which it has not been because Democratic, male, white, unionized workers will vote for Donald Trump in very large numbers. That doesn't mean that he's going to win the election because Donald Trump is well disliked in many other states by core constituencies. 
African Americans, uh, Hispanics, women. Uh, and he will lose states which the Republicans normally are competitive in or, or carry. Uh, but the upshot for me is it's going to be a very close election. And it doesn't make much sense to study the national polls. You have to look at state polls. And state polls are quite unreliable until about October. Uh, so to prevent heartache, as in the Brexit vote, don't pay too much attention to national polls. And just be assured that we are deeply polarized in the United States and almost anything can happen. Somebody might steal the con at the convention the nomination from Donald Trump. The FBI might indict Hillary Clinton. Who knows? When the Democratic Socialist gets that many votes in an American election, everything is up for grabs. I'm starting the lecture with this not because I will return to this, but because it will pose questions in your mind as I develop my argument about American primacy in a world of regions. So how does a primary power exercise power? Well, it does it to benefit everybody and, of course, itself. And the issue is always how do decision makers think? Well, they think uh, uh, about the meal, who eats whom, and they think about making love, who embraces whom. That's just a typical mindset in politics. Capacity to exercise power through bribes and through coercion. And these were the distinctions of the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and uh, foreign aid is an American innovation after 1945, particularly multilateral foreign aid. Uh, and uh, coercion is something which is constant in history. And in the United States case, Central America stands out as the great disaster area. Uh, uh, the migration issue, which has roiled American politics for decades and is now, is a consequence of American foreign policy. Uh, this is not how in the United States the issue is viewed, but that is clearly what has happened. Uh, in many ways in the United States and Central America is like France and Africa. Um, but these are just a few examples and you can fill in many others. Uh, is there a need for a primary power in, in, in the international economy? Yes, I do think so. There is a problem of free riding. Uh, these guys, you know, are smart, uh, hitching themselves to a truck. Uh, there is the issue of side payments and of course the primary power is a market for distressed goods, it offers a reserve currency, and it develops rules and a sense of fairness or legitimacy of these rules. Uh, the reserve currency issue of these three is central. If the financial crisis would replay itself, we trust financial historians, it would be more serious than the financial crisis of 2008. And I can't think anything else more serious than the crisis of the dollar. That will be a crisis of the reserve currency. That will be historically unique in the last 500 years of capitalism. And all I can advise you is have some assets when that happens because the ATM will shut down. Now, in this issue, there are unresolved issues about power. Uh, how many resources does the hegemon have to have? Uh, and the three phases of power, bargaining institutions and structures, which we are most uh, familiar with, are accompanied by a fourth phase of, phase, phase of power. I call it protein power, other people call it productive power. Uh, and I think it is the source of surprise. My students forever ask me, well, Professor, can you explain? Then comes the Arab Spring, the financial crisis, the end of the Cold War, and I say, no, I can't. And they say, well, why are you getting a salary from Cornell University if you can't explain things like that? And I said, well, uh, it is very hard to explain big surprises because the social sciences are, have convinced themselves that we live in a world of risk and not just the social sciences. It's modern society. But in fact, we live in a world of risk and uncertainty. And you just got to be aware and have a certain amount of humility that 
these surprises will occur, and then you have to figure out ways of studying surprise, which is hard. So in the thinking about the political economy of power, uh, there's always the issue of how you translate power into outcomes. That has been a problem for international relations scholarship for many, many decades. Uh, this was true of the United States and the Soviet Union. It will be true for China and India in the coming decades. It was true for Japan when it became a technological superpower. It is true for the United States today. It is a technological power. And of course, it's an issue for Europe, which prides itself of having social power. How do you use that power to shape outcomes? So preponderance uh, is something which my students understand very well. They focus, focus on uh, material capabilities. And I'm very sympathetic to it because I was the third of three in the family and I got beaten up regularly. Uh, and uh, I developed a keen awareness about when the tipping point arrived with my sister uh, and enjoyed every moment. Uh, but of course, it leaves, leaves unattended the normative elements. Uh, so one issue is there are situations for Poland, let's say, or for Korea, uh, where there's virtually no margin of choice. Uh, Polish nationalism, Korean nationalism are so strong because if you live between elephants, you get trampled on. And Koreans and Poles have never forgotten this. Uh, now, if you are free riding, like the island of Palau or Malta, and many other of the micro states, there is margins of choice. Uh, but there are lots of accidents, like the level of water might rise and your country might disappear. Okay? Uh, that normally is not an issue for big countries. So the advantage of size and power is you've got a lot of choice. That is the situation for the United States. The disadvantage of size and power, you can't hide, and there's no free riding. China and India are beginning to realize this. Okay. Large and powerful states externalize their values and their ways of doing business. And business, I mean very broadly here, uh, political and otherwise. And this generates processes, Americanization or Sinicization or Indianization or Eurasianization for Russia. Uh, Russia is a Eurasian power with a distinctive form of spreading itself. Uh, and these processes are worth our attention. Uh, they're different. It's not all Americanization. This is, of course, what uh, 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 the Americans like to think, but the world is actually more complex. So if you look at the yoga practitioners in France, it's a very large number of people. Okay. It's not just big powers which do this. Others do the same thing, always in the neighborhood. Britain versus Ireland, or Scotland now, as it turns out. Japan, Germany. Uh, and what gets externalized are normally things which are taken for granted, uh, institutionalized practices. So who invented the yodeling, whether the Austrians or the Germans, who knows, okay? But it's a consensual practice. Now what's distinctive of the United States is that it is so unconstrained that it can externalize all of its fears and hopes, both not just its fears. In this sense, the United States hopes to inscribe the world. It's like, you know, uh, British imperialism in the 19th century said, well, there's India, it needs to be inscribed by British liberalism. That was a preposterous notion, but the British believed that's what was going to happen. Uh, so this is what empires do. Uh, and in that sense, the United States, and I right now say and or America, I'll come back to that in a minute, are no exception even though this is a peculiar empire. Of course, it's maritime uh, rather than land-based, but it's a very strong ideology and it is, has a messianic moralism. You have to live in the United States to be aware of it. Uh, although, if you want to get a dose of it, you know, CNN and Fox will give you good contrast to BBC. Okay. Uh, and a mixture of profound ignorance. I can't 
overstress how ignorant Americans are about the world. Arrogance, which gets bred by ignorance, and an enormous amount of goodwill and optimism. And it's the last part, I think, which is often overlooked by the critics of America. Okay? Uh, never, never bet against the United States and America. Uh, the regenerative capacity of that system is enormous. Okay. So, in order to have a normatively grounded rule, you need to be recognized as a normative power. That Nazi Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union never did achieve. What about the United States? Well, over the last 70 years, quite substantially so in some parts of the world, where I was born, for example, empire by invitation, but not in other parts of the world. So the issue is always legitimate for whom, and of course, hegemony is, has always distributional consequences, and all legitimacy and all rule is always contested or contestable. And this is something which everybody in the world knows, except for Americans. So there have been, if you chart it, which I won't do here, there have been ups and downs. You know, there are strong decades and weak decades for the United States and America. Uh, but in the last decade, basically, you could see that Bush squandered an enormous amount of, an enormous reservoir of power, measured along multiple dimensions and Obama has failed to rebuild it. Uh, I think that the conservatives are right in the United States. It was a failure. Whether somebody else could have done it, who knows? Okay. So in our domestic debates in the United States, the left will always point to the first, and the right will always point to the second fact. And they're both right. Now this up and down in history, whether it occurs along a gradient, of hegemonic decline, I don't know. Certainly that gradient has existed for the empires of the past. Uh, certainly has existed for the United Kingdom, and we are now in the tail end of that decline of empire uh, as Great Britain breaks apart. Uh, and little England will become a small state. And there's nothing wrong with being a small state. They're pretty happy places to live. Although right now in this transition, England is not. So in the future, will the U.S. have the motivation and the capacity to be a primary power? Well, in the election of this year, this is going to be a core issue. Uh, and will it be a preponderant or hegemonic power? And that too is at stake in this election. Uh, and of course, what will be the reaction of others? And those reactions you know, will differ depending on whether they're economic rivals and political partners, or whether they're political rivals and economic partners, or whether they're hybrids in between. Their reactions will be very consequential too. So here is my brief remark on America versus the United States, which became very clear to me when I studied anti-Americanism a few years ago. Uh, the United States across the world is mostly loathed. Uh, uh, America across the world is widely admired. Take the Middle East, uh, you know, in the country like Jordan, you know, which is more pro-American than any other one, pro-US public opinion is in the low single digits, around 5%. In the hostile powers in the Middle East, admiration for various aspects of American civil society, science and technology, popular culture, economic dynamism, journalistic uh, traditions, etc., is very high. It's between 40 and 70 percent. Middle Eastern publics are very discerning of the difference between the two. Uh, and it's very important when I talk about American primacy, I do not mean, I mean the combination of the United States and America. That is the combination of the political system and as it exercises its power over the world and American civil society and how those two actually relate to each other that in fact one is undermining the other that the corrosive influence of the dynamism of American society makes it much harder for the United States to remain a primary power is one of the great ironies 
and understudied developments in rural politics. So how do we then think about American primacy? And here I come to the meat of the first part. Uh, and I use Sergio Leone as the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, as my way of talking about it. It's a movie, it's a great movie, okay? And it's a great teaching moment for all of us because it undercuts the established way of looking at binaries about isolationism or internationalism or something, motivating American foreign policy. So it's an allegory about the uh, Vietnam War and the plot revolves around three gunslingers. For those of you who know, no? The good, the bad, and the ugly, okay? Uh, um, each of the gunslingers is part of the United States. That is, US foreign policy has been a mixture of wisdom, brutality and greed, and short-term interest. So for conventionalists, for the mainstream in the United States, the US is good. For revisionists, the US is bad. And for the realists, the US is ugly. So and I think that this is a more productive way of looking at the determinants, the domestic determinants of American foreign policy than the debate about internationalism and isolationism. It gives us more play intellectually to understand the politics of policy. So here is the good, the reluctant superpower. The argument sounds familiar, even in Britain. Greatness was not sought, but thrust upon the US by external factors. It's the unintended consequence of action taken in self-defense. And then comes a whole long list of examples which typically fill out the story, starting in 1898, uh, going to World War I, uh, going to Pearl Harbor, going to the Cold War, going to the various wars after 1989, and then, of course, right now, ISIS. So is this history correct or a self-serving myth used to legitimate policymakers and to signal trustworthiness for all of those who subscribe to that story? In American politics, you have to sign up to this story to become legitimate. If you oppose it, you belong to a tiny group of cranky isolationists or UN-infected idealists. There is no way of gaining power in the United States if you do not subscribe to this view. Uh, and of course the conventional view assumes that all Americans at all times were united across history in pushing this kind of policy. And nothing could be further from the truth. And here's the bad. The limitless expansion of American capitalism, Charles Beard an unbelievably influential and important American historian. Uh, he resigns from the chair at Columbia uh, because of departmental politics. Uh, after his death, he's reviled, and he's never reclaimed his, I believe, rightful place in the history of scholarship in the United States because of his deep, deep criticism of FDR. Uh, and he argued that the U.S. foreign policy, this limitless expansion, derived from the nature of American society and economy. Why expansionism? A fairly standard Marxist argument about investment, export industries, and underconsumption. Uh, and for that thesis, all presidents in particular, that is, the executive branch of government, want expansionism. In Congress, there might be some difference, but uh, the executive branch was dedicated to expansionism. Here is the more recent updating of the same argument by William Appleman Williams, the central figure of what was called the Wisconsin School of History, a uh, very esteemed and beloved colleague of mine, Walt Lefebvre, is a member of that school. Uh, and. Uh, it's basic an interpretation of the Cold War, but dating back to 1917 and before. But for him, it's not so much a class-based analysis, but a view of different social visions, hedonism and acquisitiveness versus community. And these themes resonate quite deeply still 
with both conservatives and liberals in the United States today. Um, open door imperialism is of course something which the British developed to a high art, but for Williams, this is also the American game. And the public, the general public, supported this policy because openness connoted freedom. Political econ and uh, economic liberalism and liberty were thus viewed as mutually reinforcing from the American perspective, not from the perspective of the target countries. And then there is the ugly political realism. It really isn't a genuine American tradition. It really is too European. Cannon and Kissinger are the two main spokesmen. Uh, uh, Kissinger admired Metternich, both admired Churchill uh, as a realist and an idealist who opposes all evil. That was also my instruction in Germany when I, when I went to school. But that forgets about Churchill the racist. Uh, there is a deep affinity between liberalism and racism, uh, not just in the British case, but also in the American case. Uh, and both, of course, that is Kissinger and Cannon, uh, assume that the community of interests is the foundation for stability. Where those interests come from is then a hotly debated issue. Uh, but in the American case, that foreign policy view lacks a legitimation strategy. And a wonderful example is you know, how Kissinger was basically removed from office by a neoconservative, nascent neoconservative movement in the 1970s. Uh, Rumsfeld and Cheney being very important. They regarded him as an illegitimate imposter on America. But it remains true that realism today is central in the debates among conservatives, neoconservatives, and liberals. Uh, so in that sense, Cannon and uh, Kissinger have been very consequential. So mixing the good, the bad, and the ugly, that is, you can see that for the conventionalists, the Americans are the good, for revisionists, the bad, the realists, the ugly. To translate it into political science terms, these are multiple doctrines and multiple foreign, tra uh, foreign policy traditions reflected in multiple coalitions and institutions that have guided American foreign policy for the last 70 years. The repertoire, or the stock of traditions and ideas, is quite limited but they combine and recombine in novel ways. And the future of American policy beyond 2016 will depend, I think, largely on those combinations and recombinations, but of course also on the conditions of the world. The debates going on in the country now and in the electoral campaign, campaign will be about combining and recombining a limited repertoire of practices. So let's then turn to the reactions of the world. Uh, here is the pound and the asterisk in world politics. These are images. In the panel I attended, there was a very interesting question about how we, how we view, how we map uh, in our collective and indiv individual imagination the world. Why is the south not on top and the north on the bottom? Um, the Cold War was full of binaries. East, West, North, South, faithful, godless, capitalism, socialism, democracy, totalitarianism. And these binary distinctions are quite unhelpful. And yet, they last after the Cold War, including in this conference hall, because the panel I attended, while offering very sophisticated analysis of civilizations, was freely using the category of the West and imbuing it with agentic qualities, uh, just like Huntington. Uh, so the argument in the second half of this lecture is that there is a pervasive intermingling uh, of regional processes and regions with the US as the center or the asterisk. So the Cold War, the pound sign, post-Cold War, 1990s onward, the asterisk. Those are the two organizing images. Uh, and regions, of course, have a geopolitical and geocultural dimension. So let's talk about geopolitics. Uh, these are the materialist, realist conceptions of geography, uh, competition over territory by 
organized powers, which sometimes reduces itself to a determinist view about land versus sea power, for example, in Mersheimer's formulation. Alfred Mahan, an early, uh, early theorist of naval power, and I think a deep insight, I think it's very important to realize how important the Navy is to America's identity. Uh, and you can just go and go to the Pentagon and walk around and just look at the furniture. And you realize the Navy is there for generations. Furniture is all oak, you know, and solid wood. Uh, you go to the Army, it's all steel fire cabinets from the 1930s. You go to the Air Force, it's this sort of uh, metal and plywood furniture from the 1950s. Okay. Uh, the staying power of the Navy, of totally different kind. And the self-awareness of the Navy, of who they are, what they stand for, and that America has a naval mission. I think so that's why the naval officers always get the beautiful girls. So, um. Now Russia, in that view, from Mahan, is a land power, has large defensive capabilities, lacks access to warm water ports, uh, which constrain its power projection. So that is predetermining how Russia and eventually the United States will conflict. Uh, it is hard to conquer Eurasia, as Napoleon and Hitler found out. A second formulation by Halford McKinder in an important essay early in the 20th century about the pivot of history. It is similar to Mahan in saying that Russia is dominating the pivot. Uh, and if it connects Eurasia with Africa, it would in fact connect the world island and that would pose a great threat to the United States. Then there is Karl Haushofer who was a German professor of history tainted by Nazism. And he focuses on territoriality and his image of the world comes already closer to the post-war image. Three rising powers before World War II, the United States, Germany, and Japan, challenging British hegemony. And each with a sphere of influence defined by territory, Latin America, Europe and Africa, Western Pacific and East Asia. These are the pan regions and they will become argued Haushofer even before the Second World War, the building blocks of world politics. And here's the last one, not so well known, Nicholas Spikeman, but much more consequential. He also talks about the Eurasian heartland and its maritime rimland. He says Russian control over the rimlands might lead to global domination. That was the image that informed Kennan's telegram in 1947 by Mr. X. That became the grand strategy of the United States after 1945 and has not changed. That is defense of the remnants against the heartland. Okay. By this token, American foreign policy made a very quick peace with Germany and Japan the foreign policy of the reverse course in 1947. That was Spikeman. People credit Cannon, but Cannon was in fact deeply shaped by Spikeman and the predecessors. So geopolitics is in fact the tradition of American foreign policy, even though American liberals do not really want to fess up to it. And then there's George Orwell's 1984, uh, which gave a very chilling description of the world of regional blocks, that is a Haushofer world, uh, and a perpetual war between Oceania, Eurasia, and East Asia. And being in Australia always reminds me of that book. Let's skip geopolitics during the Cold War because it was tainted by the Nazi foreign policy doctrine. But geography has made a comeback since 1989-1991. In the form of offshore balancing theories for the United States, that is, intervene and withdraw. Uh, and it turns out that with that strategy, which Bush did not follow uh, in the war in Afghanistan and uh, um, Iraq, although Cheney wanted to, uh, 
Cheney was a, said, we got to get into Afghanistan and got get out right away. And if we have to get back in, we'll get back in and we'll get out. We should not get sucked in, but Cheney lost out. Uh, uh, uniquely, the United States is an important in all the major world regions, but it cannot dictate outcomes in any of them. With the possible exception in Central America, but even there, the migration issue has bedeviled uh, all attempts by American policymakers. Uh, so in that sense, America is a primary power in a world of regions. But the specific conditions of the different regions matter a great deal. What's the character of these regions? Well, they look like Swiss cheese. Uh, they're porous. They're political constructions. They're not given by territory. There was a very nice exchange in the Senate in 1949-1950 uh, or so uh, where some senator uh, from Tennessee or so was asking the Secretary of State how come that Italy is part of the North Atlantic? And that was a fairly good question and you know the answer he got was you know sometimes the laws of geography are subordinate to the laws of politics. And it turns out that Greece and Turkey ended up in the North Atlantic too, which stopped a lot of wars, which would have happened otherwise. Uh, after 1945, what used to be called Maritime China became Southeast Asia. I know the story particularly well because Cornell has the world's premier Southeast Asian studies program. So with the rise of China, you know, uh, Takashi Shiraishi sensei and I said, well, it is time to change the terminology of the region because the region was invented only by some British officer in 1942 or 43. The category didn't exist. But the scholars at Cornell are slow-footed and they didn't like the change. So Shiraishi left for Tokyo and I didn't study Southeast Asia. So, uh, so but maritime China becomes Southeast Asia and I think it is time to rename the region because in Chinese history, there is over the centuries always China looking towards Southeast Asia or away from it. And at the moment at which the fat man in the small bathtub rolls over, there's always a lot of water splashing on the floor. We are at that moment, okay? Therefore, maritime China seems to be a much more adequate reflection of the water on the floor. So all great, the purposes of these states extend beyond national borders. The purpose of all great states, the purpose of all large, medium states. And it's not just the purpose of the states, it's the practices of the societies of which they are a part. Uh, so the American or US primacy makes its influence felt across regions. So there was an interesting discussion at the panel this morning about what do you mean by globalization, Chris Rusnit and Tim? Well, yeah, we didn't get a really clear answer. Uh, if we'd had a little bit more time after a compelling answer about globalization, I would have asked, what do you mean by internationalization? Uh, the two are clearly linked. Uh, and when I started in graduate school, neither term existed. It was all called international interdependence. Okay. Internationalization of the category comes in the 1980s, globalization in the two, uh, 1990s. Uh, but I think they are different. Internationalization, if you go back to the Latin root, means between nations or between actors. And this is the preferred language of economics and political science, and the actor identities are not at stake. It is the increasing density of exchanges which is being observed, and they're very important. Trade, goods and services, information, people. The density of the system is increasing, but the units themselves don't change. Globalization, which is a preferred language of sociology and anthropology, sees a compression of time and space which is making puts into play the identities of the actors. Okay. These two images of the world and these two processes are hopelessly intertwined. Okay. Um, so 
sorting them, I think it's important to sort them out in our heads for analytical purposes, but in terms of empirical observation, uh, uh, they're, they're, you cannot disentangle them. Now, why is this important? The combined impact of internationalization and globalization makes the regionalism of our generation very different from the regionalism before U.S. primacy. If you go back to the regionalism of the 1930s, which was fully theorized in Europe and in Japan, it was a block regionalism. It was self-contained. Germany's new order, Japan's co-prosperity sphere. Both reflected the geopolitical theorizing of their days as closed regional systems uh, that were not open to world markets. In fact, after 1929 to 20, uh, 33, world markets were being shut down. Uh, and of course, the kind of ethno-nationalism which rose in the 1930s meant that cultural impulses from abroad were repelled. Uh, furthermore, those regional blocs were vertically linked uh, to different political units. And that image of hierarchical um, regional relations you will still find in French theories uh, in the Grenoble School looking at the international division of labor from the 1960s to the 1990s and it still resonates. The high value added in the commodity chains you know, normally resides in the more powerful part. And I always tell my students, let's look at our iPhones and they, or your Apple computer and they dig out their iPhones and say, how much did you pay? Well, some time ago it was 500 bucks. And then I say, well, what do you think the profits go? Okay, and they say, well, China is gaining a lot. I said, how much profits go where? Okay, and it turns out that China gets about $40 of the $500. Okay. The rest of the profits go to Apple and to the major component producers. The data are from Mark Selden. Okay. Uh, so thinking about the hierarchy, therefore, the rise of China, yes, it's a very high growth rate, and the Chinese middle class is expanding enormously, and Chinese poverty has declined by 400 million, which has never happened in the rise of, in, in the history of capitalism, all under the auspices of the neoliberalism, which the Euro, uh, European and American left doesn't like, but the Chinese do, okay. But that doesn't mean that China is rising in the global hierarchy of the division of labor. That's still another question. Okay? The Chinese are working hard at it, and they're very smart to reverse this. Okay? So there are vertical relations linking regional complexes and regions to different political units. But they also penetrate the regions. They help making these regions look like Swiss cheese. There were, of course, alliance patterns which reinforced that image. They were permitted under the UN Charter, okay? And they're regional customs unions, which are freeing trade uh, within regions, often without raising significant trade barriers between regions. Sometimes there are significant trade barriers. Uh, right now, there's a big debate in England. They want to have access to the common market. And I always wonder why, why do they think that this is so important since the devaluation of the pound by 20% is much larger than any tariff levels which they would encounter on the European continent. That is, you can manipulate your exchange rate in a week by amounts which are much larger than what it takes 10 years to negotiate in trade negotiations. Okay. Um, so regionalization then are these processes uh, of Americanization, uh, and they do not just emanate from America. Instead, they emanate from different parts of the world uh, and from other states and regions. Uh, so these, the fusion and engagement of these processes then creates the global international environment in which states operate. So here's Americanization versus U.S. When I grew up, I knew nothing about the United States. I knew a lot about America, which for me translated into Elvis Presley. Okay? Uh, 
which I deeply admired and liked because my parents hated it. That was the most important thing. Okay? America, in the example of Presley or jazz, was deeply subversive. And that's its great, great, great power. It challenges power hierarchies all over the world. Uh, when Obama gets elected, everybody says, why can't we have an Obama? And Obama was not the black man. Obama was a symbol. So American society undermines all orders, national and regional, or American imposed. And it is that subversive quality, I think, which is an engine of change. Just think about the technological dynamism of Silicon Valley and uh, the billions people make, but all the billions people lose. I mean, it is a casino of unbelievable vitality. Okay. And young people in America are drawn to it, like bees to the honeypot. What about Europeanization, which uh, Bull and Watson are writing about? Well, it has an internal dimension, which economic and social historians have studied, Hartmut Kelber's work, for example, which common social practices which have been emerging over the last century in family structure, education, employment systems, consumption patterns of urban life. Part of the shock of Brexit for the young in Britain is that they are so much part of it, they are now worried about it. Will this, will this be discontinued or slowed down? This kind of Europeanization. You know, you're, you're a student, you, know, you go study abroad and you go back to take your degree and then you find a job in a European country. The European young generation is highly mobile. It's about 30% of that generation, right? So this is an important part of Europeanization. Now the external dimension, this uh, we all know the standard of civilization, but since World War II, in particular since 1957, it's really the creation of a multi-level polity. Uh, it's not an actor, it's a governance system. And uh, when the Americans always complain, who do we call up in Brussels, that's not understanding. It's looking at Europe through American eyes. There is no no capital to call. There's a governance system which is evolving. Uh, and enlarging that Europe from 6 to 12 to 15 to now 27 or whatever makes governance much harder. And that is part of what this political debate in Europe is about. <coughs> and it is a political debate. It's not an onslaught of fascism. I think it's a vast mistake to regard the debate from the right as all neo-fascist. It is a debate. Many of them are Gaullist Europeans. Uh, so this is democracy brings not only the good message from the left, it also brings the dislike message from the right. And I think the Europeans confront a difficult situation, but I'm pretty optimistic about it. What about cynicization? Well, cynicization, I did a book on cynicization. I can tell you it made me a rock star in China. You enter as a foreign professor, you enter a Chinese lecture hall, everybody claps. And when you don't know China, you think, oh, they like you. This has nothing to do with you. Okay, so this is a Bob Cohen joke. They all clapped when I gave a lecture. I said, Bob, they clap for everybody who's a professor. Okay, oh, uh, so he was quite disappointed. So, uh, but cynicization is like a concept which there is a big drum in China, and it resonates right away. And it resonates the same way the concept of Americanization resonates in the United States. Because Chinese and Americans think these are processes which go in one direction. And I always tell Americans, well, and the Chinese, you want to see Americanization? Why don't you go to Detroit? Because the world has a habit of kicking back. It took the Japanese only 20 years to figure out how to out compete GM, Chrysler, and Ford. And Detroit became a disaster area. So it's not a unilinear process. All of these are two-way streets. Okay. Uh, and of course, historically, synthesization has always been a two-way street. Let's just think about the history of the Manchus. Uh, 
So sinicization will have very unpleasant consequences for China. The political elite is fully aware of it. That's why they're so worried. And the delegitimacy of the political elite and the party in the eyes of the Chinese population will only increase because of the reverse, the world kicking back to China, sinicization. Japanization. Well, Japanese have always, I think it's the most tragic of countries because they've always been thinking of themselves as apart from others. Still remember Fukuda in 1977, it was the first summit, you know, of whatever the G number was then, three or five or seven. Uh, he was sitting by himself. Nobody was talking to him. He couldn't understand a single joke. He couldn't make a joke. And they all made fun of him. Okay? I always thought this was a tragic story. And in that sense, Japan is a tragic case because the debate on internationalization, internationalizing Japan of the 1980s was in fact a kind of nationalism, something which we didn't fully understand what was happening. Uh, but at the same time, Japan as an industrial civilization has had enormous dynamic vitality. And as a polity, it has enormously successful governance mechanisms. People always talk about the Japanese crisis. Well, let me tell you, it's the nicest crisis you can think of. Okay. And so new lifestyles in Asia are, have been dramatically shaped by Japan's popular culture industry. Just think about the Chinese attitudes towards Japan and the fact that most children's programs in China now are Japanese productions. That's rather remarkable, okay. Uh, the Japanese talk about making themselves odorless, shedding their Japanese characteristics to become a cultural and commercial success. Indianization. Well, India is the maritime center. India is the most perfect 21st century big power. Uh, it is so disorganized and so incoherent that it goes with the waves. And uh, when I was in New Delhi two years ago interviewing, they just, they said, we admire our Chinese brothers a great deal, but what a rough hand they have. They're not made for this century. They will be so traumatized by it. Uh, so Indian writers writing in English, Bollywood, a vibrant diaspora, this is a great power made for the 21st century because it can't get its act together. And finally, Islamicization. Really without a territorial base. Uh, you know, it stretches from in Indonesia to, I don't know, Morocco, right? Uh, uh, a little bit like Americanization. America has a territorial base, but it's sub the subversive quality of American society has the dynamic qualities of Islam. Uh, and Islam is both hybrid and repellent. I mean, if you see the images of uh, uh, Mecca, you know, I'm in the shopping mall in Big Ben all next door, and you're saying, what, what on earth is this? Well, it's a hybrid civilization, deeply commercial, deeply religious. Uh, and how this, these strands in Islam will work themselves out, how it will work itself through, will have a lot to do with how other parts of the world will relate to Islam. Islam is part of every part of the world, just like China. And, uh, but the model, the model politics which comes from it is totally different from sinicization. So what can we say about regionalization? Well, it, globalization is probably a shorthand for the sum total of these intersecting, intermingling processes of regionalization. And it's certainly globalization is not just Americanization. That is just an American conceit. So the processes themselves are open-ended. They are in part marked by diffusion, emulation, and adaptation. They lead to distinctive production and consumption patterns of both material and symbolic objects. And of course, they lead to characteristic patterns of behavior and practices. So what's the future? One future often invoked by politicians who I think are only a few decades behind times, but who may be right at the cutting edge of history, because that certainly is the image of Donald Trump, is a geopolitics 
with regional blocs. Uh, so the U.S. under Republican rule might well turn out to push this kind of future. It is conceivable that China will establish a regional primacy along those lines in Asia, although I doubt it very much. It overlooks a thousand years of petty capitalism in China. That's the title of a very nice little book. Uh, and it overlooks the Silk Road project and the, connective, the connectivity of China, because China is not just the People's Republic, China is also the overseas Chinese. And I discovered the power of the overseas Chinese in Budapest. Um, so, but it is true that Russia and Eurasia, or Brazil and Latin America, or Nigeria and South Africa, you know, or Iran or Saudi Arabia and Middle East, maybe Germany, Europe, these are all candidates for that kind of Europe. So the, the BRICS authors, that is the people who wrote these books about the BRICS at the top of the resource boom, it was a well-coordinated well publication strategy. Uh, uh, that's what they have in mind. But I think the resource boom is quite different from politics of regional blocs. It's, this would be moved by politics. It wouldn't be moved by factor prices. Uh, and the politician who could move it most would be a Republican president in the coming election. So this would be one future. The second one would be the one, uh, and I believe in the second one, of porous regions. Regional orders and regionalization. And it will be marked by the three phases of power. Let's call that the United States. Uh, the power to bargain of institutionalized cooperation and of structural asymmetries. But it is marked also by America, the fourth phase of power, which is full of uncertainty, which is fully subversive, which creates surprise, which is what my students have always asked to answer. So the question my students ask is, how do we study primacy in regions? And I always tell them, that the motto of my academic career has been not to speak at length about countries you haven't flown over at night at least once. Thank you. <laughs>